Well, hello everyone. If you're watching this, you must be interested in what's happening on Wye River Beach. If you've been to Wye River lately, you will have noticed that we're seeing some significant erosion on the sort of lawn end of the beach near the Wye Surf Lifesaving Club. And so in the interest of trying to talk through what's going on, why it's happening and what the possible measures might be to mitigate these issues, both in the short and long term, we thought we'd do a few of these chats and put them up on Facebook so that everyone can be informed about the situation. So today we're joined by Daniel Iridiakonu, who's an Associate Professor of Marine Science at Deakin University, and Daniel's based at Warrnambool. Hi, Daniel, thanks for this. G'day, Zoe, good to see you. So what would you say are the main issues that are causing the erosion that we're seeing of late on Wye River Beach? Look, okay, it's a good question, Zoe, and um, as I'm sure many of your listeners know, it's pretty complicated. Um, you know, we are seeing erosional hotspots along multiple beaches on the Victorian coast. So we think that there's some broader climatic drivers at play as well. Uh, for example, um, we have established a wave boy network measuring the wave climate. And if you look at the modelling that's occurred, we've seen a 5% increase in significant wave heights along the Victorian coast. So that has direct implications to our coastline, the shape of our coast, um, the amount of erosion or deposition that occurs, and can have huge implications um, as we progress into the future in terms of what happens along our coastal areas. So is this new or is this a cyclical event? That's another good question. Um, uh, you know, beaches come and go. Um, beaches are designed to erode. Um, often humans put infrastructure in areas in the primary compartment of the beach, in the primary dunes. Um, which are the natural sort of buffers for our beach areas. And, you know, a lot of the work that we've done has investigated historical aerial photographs um, back to the 1940s. And in some areas, we are actually seeing very significant erosion events um, that have occurred in the past through individual storms or multiple storms. So it's, you know, it's definitely by no means the first time there's been erosion at this particular beach. And I'm sure um, you know, we'll see additional events happening in the future. I think the concern is, is that you know, perhaps we're seeing a greater frequency of events, perhaps we're seeing a change in the sediment supply for these beaches, and that could have longer term implications for our coastal areas. Well, yeah, because I, I guess people who've been going down to this part of our coast for, for perhaps many years, perhaps, you know, 40, 50 years in some cases or even longer, would say, oh, it always goes back to the way it was in the end. It, it'll, it'll fix itself. Is that possible or likely in your view? Look, um, I haven't seen the detailed data reports and analytics that have been undertaken for Y River um, in particular. But from what I can see from what's happened there, you know, we've had some pretty serious riverine inputs from the catchments. We've seen a change in the channel direction um, of Y River. Uh, that's that's you know, been compounded by implications of fires across those catchments, um, high rainfall events. So it's not just about um, what's happening in terms of the wave climate. It's complicated. And yeah, I, I think, um, we probably need to start thinking about our coasts in a bit of a different way. Um, we need to really think twice about putting permanent or semi-permanent structures in the beach envelope, if you like. I think that's one thing that we do need to think about. Um, but yeah, there is, I think in this circumstance, um, you know, there, there's definitely um, the likelihood that the river will go back to its original course, um, heading further to the west and, and that 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 beach area will regenerate to a certain degree. Um, I suppose the question is, is, you know, is it right to have infrastructure there or should we be thinking about perhaps temporary access points and temporary towers so we're prepared um, for potential events like this into the future? Mm. So that, that's a, a kind of longer term issue that you're talking about, you know, the viability of having those sorts of structures so close to the, the dune line or the shoreline. 
in the meantime, though, we're sort of grappling with the fact that we do have a surf lifesaving club there. We also have a, a caravan park there. Yeah. And that's the way in which we're using that space currently. So when you consider the things that you're talking about, um, wave height, changes in weather, um, potential bushfire contribution and the, the fact that we've had landslips further up the the catchment, which might be affecting the water flow. When you consider all those sorts of things, what options does that give us in terms of making that area functional, at least in the short to medium term? Yeah, oh, look, that's a really difficult question, Zoe. Um, you know, our coastal regions are going to face unprecedented pressures based on our climate projections into the future with sea level rise and changes that we're likely to see in our climate. Um, obviously, Y River is an incredibly special place. Um, my wife's family have been there for camping there for over 60 years. Um, it's an amazing place. And, we're, and as, as, as Victorians, we're, we're attracted to our coastal environments and, and these places are incredibly important um, for our community. So that, there has to be some sort of balance there. Um, I suppose, you know, one of the things that I keep thinking about is lessons from the past, um, you know, and we've seen a lot of issues occur in coastal areas where we've gone in very hard and very quickly and put in hard structures to protect assets. And often those hard structures don't end up with long term benefits for those communities. So. You know, I don't think anyone wants to see a rock wall go in or if they do, maybe they're not aware of the potential implications of, of putting a, a rock wall where you may lose your beach in its entirety in the, in the long term. So I think thinking about soft solutions and trying to mitigate um, potential implications for now is, is the way to go. Um, hoping, um, you know, and planning for some regeneration of that area, but also planning longer term in terms of retreat and where, where we may be in 50 or 100 years' time. And I, I think that's something that we've lacked um, from a planning perspective and something that's really coming across strong in the new Marina Coastal Act and the policies that we see, that we really need to start planning for the future. Um, the climate is changing. Um, we have evidence that's showing that with significant wave heights already increasing along these areas of the coasts. So I think, you know, we really need to start thinking about that longer term and having some potentially some hard discussions for some of our coastal communities about what the future may actually entail. So there's a lot to unpack in what you've just said. I mean, firstly, starting at the back end of that, you do think that what's happening to some degree is related to our, our changing climate. You, you think that that's a given? Oh, look, I'm not sure if it's a given, Zoe. It's, there's definitely changes in our wave climate that have been modelled and, and there's evidence in the Southern Ocean that you know, wave climate's changed, significant wave height by 5%. Um, we're actually seeing an increase in our, in our wave period, which potentially could provide more power to the coast as well. Um, but, you know, in the back of my mind, we're in the beach envelope. So these areas are designed to erode and to come back. And typically we see recovery. Um, there are sites um, where things are being compounded through intervention, um, through stoppaging of sediment transport, for example, um, where perhaps a downstream impact of sediments not getting to those locations is implicating the sediment supply that you actually have for those beaches. And we've seen remnants of those all along the coast. Um, classic examples of the Port of Portland, for example, and the erosion of Dutton Way. Um, that's simply a function of uh, sediment supply. Um, erosion at Apollo Bay, um, you know, if we did the sediment budgets for that area, you'd probably find that a lot of that sediment's actually locked up in the dune systems um, that could have potentially um, come around to those beaches, but it's been blocked through infrastructure. So, you know, I think it's more complicated than just saying it's a, a direct climate thing that, you know, there's definitely going to be challenges in terms of climate. Um, it's definitely going to exacerbate some of the changes that we see and potentially um, cause issues in terms of the recovery time periods as well. Mm. Now, 
let, let's get back to some of the solutions that you talked about or the, the possible options. So you mentioned, you, you referenced um, hard structures and, and specifically we're talking about rock. Can you just break down for us why putting in a rock wall there could end up losing the beach? What, what's the you know connection between those two things? Why would that be a potential impact? Um, look, it's it's sort of what we've seen in some areas. Uh, Port Ferry is a classic example. Um, we've built um, sections of rock walls. Um, at the end of those rock walls, we've seen transfer of energy and greater erosion. So we've extended those rock walls and, and we continue to extend. Um, so, so what you're saying is that when, when the sea hits a hard surface, then the impact is greater. So it's going to in effect, suck more sand away from the beach. So you end up with less sand on the beach. Is that Potent is that kind of a layman's view? Yeah, well, potentially. Like, it depends, obviously, on the situation. And, and this is where you really do need those studies to understand the hydrodynamic process specific for that area. But in general, um, what you do find is that often that beach steepens as well. So you don't have as much natural beach or you potentially lose the beach in, in its entirety um, due to that sort of sort of transport processes. But often at the end of the rock walls, you see issues, greater erosion occurring. And that's why Port Ferry, you know, we've seen extensions of the rock walls over the decades to protect um, a greater area of those sort of beaches. Um, but and you know Port Phillip Bay, most of Port Phillip Bay is fortified, and I, I think we really need to think about: is that really what we want for our natural beaches and and our you know our expectations of our of our beaches, and whether it's the right solution in the long term? Mm. Um, I'm not convinced it is, but obviously it's more complicated than just that. And you know sometimes there is a need to to um, make a decision to protect an asset and you know, a revetment might be the only way that you can do that. But we need to put all things on the table, including planned retreat and thinking about the future of our children and, and their children and what this area is going to be like for them in a, in a changing sort of climate as well. Okay, so if um, rock, putting rock down is one option that's being considered, uh, another option, which is a, a softer option, is sandbags. What, what's your position on sandbagging as a potential way of managing the situation, even as a, a short-term option? Yeah, look, again, um, you know, all this needs to be identified by detailed data analytics for that particular area. And that, you know, that's going to be informed by the, the reports that are currently underway, to my understanding. So, you know, without understanding that, data and those outputs, um, it's hard to say, but my, the thing about soft solutions is that um, they tend to not have long lasting impacts. And I think you mentioned, Zoe, that even through the erosion that has been seen at Y River, there's evidence of historical sandbags in those er erosional sequences, right? So mm -hmm. it, something definitely has happened there before, otherwise you wouldn't have those sandbags there. And, and obviously those beaches recovered. So, you know, there are options. I think at the moment there's some scraping going on and movement of sediment within that, that, that sort of beach envelope. Um, you know, another option may be bringing in additional s sediment to try and boost the actual sediment in that compartment and sort of dampen the effects of the erosion. Um, sandbags, you know, could definitely be an option to try and protect um, structures in the short term and, and sort of allow or promote natural recovery. Um, but yeah, to me, you know, the last thing I, I, you know, I want to see is a fortified coast, um, if we can avoid it. You know, well, I love our natural beaches. Um, the beaches at White River are stunning. And um, they will go through these cycles and these erosional events and, and quite large erosional events that we'll see in the future as well. And I think we just need to be prepared and, and um, hopefully design our infrastructure to be able to sort of um, cope with that and, you know, preferably not in the primary gene. Mm. So you mentioned the sand scraping, and this is something that I'll discuss with Gokapa during the different chat, and that's very much a stopgap 
that's being employed while this sort of bigger picture conversation is is taking place. But just on that, uh, it occurs to me as well that obviously the seasonality of the uh, erosion comes with the the weather patterns of the time. So you know we're in the middle of winter right now, where we would expect to be getting these big seas and storms. Is it likely that um, it will sort of stabilise just with the season naturally over the next few months as we head into summer anyway, which sort of buys us a bit more time too? Yeah, that, that's a really good comment, Zoe. Um, as we know, um, these patterns that we see um, are seasonal. Um, it doesn't mean that we don't have significant wave events in summer. We know that we do. And, but typically... We have these erosional events occurring over winter and we see recovery over the summer sort of period um, due to the lessening of that sort of wave energy. Um, and, you know, potentially a reduction of flow coming from that catchment as well, which is obviously causing a lot of um, erosional issues in Wai River itself. So, you know, definitely, um, you know, we'd, we'd hope to see some natural recovery occurring over those summer months. But I think it's also important to think that what we see on the beach is a relatively small part of these sediment compartments. And um, what I mean by that is the sediment supply that we're talking about is interconnected on our coast down to, to the wave base, which off Wye River is you know, 50 metres of water depth. So a lot of the work we're doing is trying to understand the sediment supply way offshore. And the other thing that's really interesting for me, and you know, I'm a biologist by trade, I'm, I'm very much an ecologist, is that a lot of the sediment that we see is made up of animals. It's, it's, it's carbonate dominated. So it's really the breakdown of these um, bryzoans, these invertebrate communities offshore that are contributing to our beaches. So I think there are some bigger questions about sediment supply. Um, is our sediment supply changing in Bass Strait. Um, it's a relatively sediment-starved system, but you know, are we seeing slowdown in production of these offshore reefs that are providing sediments to, to our beaches? You know, these are some questions that, that we're, we're doing some research to try and get a better handle of. Um, but yeah, it is, it's not just what you see on the beach. The beach has a large envelope, a catchment if you like, um, and it's interconnected, and, and we really need to understand those dynamics of that sediment offshore and how that interacts with what we see on our beach. Well, Daniel, we appreciate your time today and no doubt we'll hit you up again for some more answers as more questions uh, pop up during this process. Thank you so much. Pleasure, Zoe. Thank you. Everyone, that was Daniel Iridiakonu, who's an Associate Professor of Marine Science at Deakin Uni at Warrnambool. And this is part of a public information process that is being supported by the Y River Surf Lifesaving Club. Thanks a lot for watching.